Welcome back to part 39 of our study of Christian doctrine, where we are looking at the doctrine of the church, or as it's known by its technical name, ecclesiology. In the previous two messages, we have established from the Bible that the church, or I should say church membership, is a regenerate church membership. That is to say that the true church is comprised of saved people, the redeemed of God. While it's true that on this earth anyway, there will be gathered together with true believers, unbelievers who know that they're lost, and false believers who may profess Christ but do not possess Christ, the true church, through the ages, for eternity, is comprised of those who are truly saved, the redeemed of God, those whom Christ has redeemed. We also established in the previous study that since the church is comprised of true believers, that this would have to include all believers, especially uh, Old Covenant, Old Testament believers who looked forward, looked ahead to Christ, um, just as believers today look back to Christ. Now, I quoted uh, this from uh, part 38 of the study last time. Old Covenant saints were saved by the Christ of prophecy, and New Covenant saints were saved by the Christ of history. One looked ahead to Christ, and the other looks back on Christ. The historical event of uh, Christ's incarnation, uh, birth, um, ministry, atoning death, resurrection, ascension. Tonight, we're going to look at what might be called the nuts and bolts of the church, and by that I mean we're going to look at begin looking at the offices of the church, uh, pastor, deacon, uh, the ordinances of the church, the Lord's Supper, baptism, uh, the government of the church, what kind of government is, is the church or should the church be, uh, the purpose of the church such as worshiping God, uh, being the expression of the kingdom of God on this earth, the church being the pillar and ground of truth, uh, the church existing to equip the saints, that is, God's people, uh, spiritual gifts in the church, and preaching the gospel, of course. Um, we might look at biblical metaphors for the church that are in the Bible, uh, such as the church being the bride of Christ, that's a metaphor. And then, uh, lastly, we will look at the future of the church. And by that I mean the church will endure through this world and inherit the fullness of the kingdom of God when Christ returns. So, tonight, uh, we're just going to look at uh, the biblical offices or officers of the church, and which are the office of, of pastor and the author, <laughs> office of deacon. And I'm going to start with the office of, of deacon. So why didn't I mention that first, right? So as we consider the biblical office of deacon, Christ gave the church two offices, the office of pastor and the office of deacon. When we Consider the office of deacon, and understanding that that word simply means to serve. All Christians are actually called to serve Christ with their lives and all that we do. That means that we can serve Christ on our job. Uh, you don't have to be a pastor or a deacon or a missionary to, in order to serve Christ. You serve Christ where you are, who you are, where God has placed you. But we need to understand that in the New Testament we read that these two offices, office of deacon and the office of pastor, are established by Christ as sort of leadership, servant leadership in the church <clears throat> to serve God's people, the body of Christ, which is another metaphor uh, for the church in the Bible, the body of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I said, we're going to start with the office of deacon tonight. And what we find, uh, um, and I know uh, some biblical Theologians do not believe that Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, which is where we're going to look at here in a second. Uh, some scholars don't believe that's where the church actually, or the office of deacon actually starts. Uh, I'm inclined to think that it does. And it seems from this text in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, that the office of deacon emerged from a crisis uh, within the early church. And again, this crisis is recorded in Acts 6, 1 through 7. Let me read this to you. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews. So the complaint uh, 
by the Hellenists, that would be the Greek-speaking Jews, rose against the Hebrews, that is, the Jewish uh, Christian Jews, the Greek-speaking Christian Jews who were in the church. And this complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews arose because their widows the Greek-speaking Jewish Christian widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution, that is, the daily distribution of food. And the twelve, which of course would be the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. That's interesting because those are all Greek names. So they chose these Greek-speaking uh, men. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So the early church was primarily Jewish in its, in its makeup. Uh, Jews who had uh, repented of their sin and put their faith in Christ, the Messiah. And widows in that time period, obviously, didn't have any uh, social support. Orphans and widows suffered tremendously in the ancient world, and the early church uh, made sure that the widows and orphans were taken care of. And so there were widows there who were Jewish converts to Christ, who spoke Greek. They were from outside of Jerusalem, Israel. And then, of course, there were those Jewish Christian widows who, who spoke Hebrew. Well, when the food was being distributed, uh, the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected or overlooked. So what we learn from this text, then, is that the office of deacon was established to meet this crisis, to meet specifically a physical need among the church. Now, in order to meet this need, the church selected seven men, not just seven men, but seven godly men. And they were put in charge of ensuring that these Greek-speaking widows were receiving enough food during the daily distribution. So the purpose of establishing the office of, of deacon was to ensure that those who were ministering the word, the apostles, would not have to neglect the word in order to, as verse 2 says, serve tables, which was a reference to the daily distribution of food. And so... Uh, not only was it established so that the apostles could continue to uh, preach the word, minister the word, but also to make sure that the physical needs were being met. Now the word serve tables, that word serve in verse 2 is where we get the word deacon from. The Greek word is diakoneo, uh, deacon. You can hear the word diakoneo there, deacon. It simply means to serve. Since all of God's people are servants, what sets a deacon apart? What sets the deacon apart from the pastor, or the pastor from the deacon, if you will? Well, the office of deacon is primarily concerned with meeting physical needs, the physical needs of the body of Christ. Well, the office of pastor is primarily concerned with meeting the spiritual needs of the body of Christ, the church. So the deacon's primary focus is, is serving the church in the capacity of making sure physical needs go met, get met, whereas the pastor primarily is concerned with making sure the spiritual needs of God's people gets met through the preaching of the word. Now, that doesn't mean that a pastor can't serve tables or that a deacon can't teach or something. We'll get into that in just a minute. We'll emphasize, before we move on to the qualifications of a deacon, uh, that these men would have to be men, quote, of, of verse 3, of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit, and of wisdom. So these men were godly. They were spiritually mature in their faith. And they were being therefore equipped to meet a physical need in the church, but they must be spiritually grounded and men of God themselves. So let's look at the qualifications for a deacon. And for that, we turn to 1 Timothy 3, 
8 through 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That, that says that uh, they, they know what they believe, and why they believe it, and they're settled in their faith. And let them, verse 10, and let them also be first tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, that is the wives of the deacons, must likewise be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, now the verses that come before this, immediately come before this, in First uh, Timothy 3, 1-7, through has the office of pastor, the qualifications for, for those who would seek to be pastors or elders in the church. And the qualifications for the office of deacon are very, very similar to the qualifications for the office of pastor. Both lists of qualifications strongly emphasize the spiritual maturity of the candidate that's being considered for the office, with really the only major difference between the office of deacon and pastor is that the pastor or elder must be able to teach, uh, according to 1 Timothy 3.2, while the office of deacon does not require that uh, they be required uh, able to teach. But that doesn't mean that a deacon can't teach. Uh, there's a deacon in uh, church, my pastor, that I call on from time to time to fill in for me uh, in, in Sunday school when I can't be there. Uh, there have been deacons uh, who have spent a great deal of time in, the, in their churches uh, teaching the Word of God in Sunday school classes and so forth. So the primary emphasis for a deacon is meeting uh, physical needs, but that doesn't mean that they, they can't teach because that qualification is not listed. We see in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15, and then chapter 7, 1 through 60, and then 8, chapter 8, 5 through 12, and then verses 26 through 40, uh, two deacons, Stephen and Philip, who were actually preaching and evangelizing. So there you go. Any church, I would say, uh, based on these biblical quali qualifications, that is in the process, process of selecting a deacon or deacons, would be foolish to ignore these biblical qualifications, especially the, this emphasis on spiritual maturity and godliness. Even though the primary focus of the office of deacon concerns meeting physical needs in the church, that doesn't mean that that office is not spiritual. Because there is indeed a spiritual dynamic at work here in which the deacons who are serving the body of Christ are manifesting this Christ-like spirit and love among those whom they are being, uh, those who are being served by them, but also by outsiders who hear of this and see of this demonstration of Christ-like love in the body of Christ. So, uh, the office of deacon is very important because it's established by Christ. It's essential because it's established by Christ. Just because it meets a physical need doesn't mean that, that it's less than the office of pastor who's meeting a spiritual need. Uh, pastors meet physical needs too. But the primary focus of the office of deacon is to serve the church, making sure that physical needs are being met so that the, the, the people who are in need are no longer in need, and then that the pastor can uh, preach the word and, and God blesses the church when its officers are godly men doing what they've been called to do. Now, the, the age-old, I don't know if it's an age-old question, but it certainly uh, is prominent today, is that, that is, can a woman serve as the office of deacon? Now, there are, uh, there's a divide in the church on this. Some say yes, some say no. Those who say that a woman can serve, uh, some of these are very conservative, godly uh, theologians and pastors, I'm inclined to say that, that I don't believe the Bible teaches that a, a, a woman can be a deaconess. And I want to begin with the text that those who say a woman can serve as a deaconess uh, is Romans 16, verses 1 and 2, which says, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea. Servant is the word diakonos, diakonos, deacon that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So why would someone see in this verse the 
teaching that a woman can be a deacon or a deaconess. Well, when the Apostle Paul says in verse 1, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church, obviously, again, the word servant is diakonos, where we get the word for deacon. And while it's true that this is indeed the word for deacon, and the word for deacon means to serve, the context in which the word occurs helps us to interpret whether or not the word is being used to describe the office of deacon or is talking about uh, being just a servant of the church as all Christians are called to be and to do. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome and he's commending Phoebe to them that they should welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, that is, of God's people, and help her in whatever she may need from you. So Phoebe here is mentioned first in this letter, and that gives her kind of a prominent place in Paul's letter. And in this, he is highlighting uh, her service at the church at Sancria. She is primarily known for being, as Paul writes in verse 2 though, a patron of many and of myself as well. So she, she was, she's considered a servant of the church as all Christians are, but he mentions her specifically and he mentions her first because she is, in fact, uh, a patron of many, and especially of the Apostle Paul. So when Paul highlights her service at the church at Sancria, it doesn't necessarily indicate that she was a deaconess. But some would say, what about Paul's concern that the church welcome her in the Lord, as verse 2 says, in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from them? Well, it appears that Sister Phoebe uh, is in Rome on some sort of important capacity or needful capacity and so what are we to make of this was she there as an officer of the church because it sounds a lot like um, what Paul writes about the church is helping those who are passing through and ministering the word and all that but is it an office of deacon is she a deaconess or was she a servant of the church just in a, in a general sense well, the text doesn't say why she was visiting the church at Rome. Now, most scholars do agree that she was probably the one that brought the letter uh, to the church at Rome, but it doesn't say what specifically she was doing there. But Paul emphasizes the fact that they need to help her with whatever she needs. Okay, but the main reason why I don't believe that Phoebe is a deaconess is because the biblical qualifications for a deacon are in the scripture only given to men. And I take you back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. He says, Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. So some would use that part of, uh, would take verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and say that that's not necessarily, you know, the word wives, uh, as it's translated here, does not necessarily mean that these are wives of deacons. It could also be translated women. That it's also listing qualifications for them. But verse 12 says, Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. So I think if Paul was saying that women could be deacons, then he would have specifically mentioned that uh, the deaconess needs to be the wife of one husband. But he just mentions that deacons should be uh, the husband of one wife. All right, so that's kind of a flyby, a quick flyby over the office of deacon. And as I said earlier in this message, all Christians are called to be deacons in the sense of that word, which is we are all to be servants of Christ, servants of one another. But the biblical office of deacon uh, sets apart godly men who are called by the church to primarily, not exclusively, but primarily meet the physical needs of the congregation. And again, this doesn't mean that a deacon can't teach or something, or that the office of deacon is less spiritual than the office of a pastor. Now, as we said before, the primary responsibility of the office of pastor is meeting the spiritual needs of the people, whereas the deacon meets the physical needs of the people. The office of deacon uh, is necessary for a healthy, functioning church because Christ has established that office to ensure that the work of Christ, both the spiritual and the physical work of Christ, does not get neglected. And uh, a deacon is no less holy than the pastor, and the pastor is no less holy than a deacon, and 
and neither office are more holy than God's people in general or overall. Uh, but these men who are called into both of these offices must demonstrate uh, spiritual maturity in their faith and in their actions. All right, so again, that was a quick flyover of the office of deacon. Uh, next time, uh, we'll pick back up with the office of pastor and then, then progress through that and get into more of the nuts and bolts of, of church as, as given us in the New Testament. So ho hopefully you can tune in next time, and God be with you all. Bye-bye.